Well, Jonah, last time we heard about Jonah, he was kind of in a bad way, wouldn't you say? I was reading a little bit of uh, history, and let me paraphrase what Samuel ja uh, Johnson said. And I think this might be maybe where Jonah finds himself, maybe where we find ourselves, or you find yourself. This is what Samuel Johnson uh, said. There is nothing that can clear your mind like having that certain knowledge that in the morning they're going to be shot. That'll clear your mind, right? You'll start putting things in place. You'll start saying, okay, was this the wisest choice that I made? But, you see, for that phrase to really be true, you have to come to your senses. I think that's where Jonah's at in the second chapter. I hope you brought your Bibles. The second chapter, Jonah has to come to his senses that, that he's in a bad fix. I found in, in the 40 plus years of pastoral ministry that, that it, it's impossible to help someone who isn't struggling with their sin. As long as someone is struggling with the sin that's dragging them down, then they're more likely than not ready to set their priorities in the right order. I, I would say it this way, that true repentance, not the repentance that we think of today, let me tell you, God, I'm sorry, but I'll see you at such and such. A, no, th th we're talking about true repentance. Always, not sometimes, not maybe, not could be, but always involves setting our priorities right. Oh, it doesn't matter whether it's an individual. It doesn't matter whether it's a small group. It doesn't matter whether it's a church. True repentance, saying that we are going to follow God always involves setting our priorities straight according to what God is asking. It, and, and that means, let me just say what that means, the next step of that means is that we come clean with God and with each other. It means owning up to our whole pattern of wrongdoing. And the way that we've been operating not in the notes. The sermon's short, so I'll make sure, I want to make sure you get your full 90 minutes worth. <laughs> we, were, we were blessed to serve in a small church. Oh, actually, it was two small churches, and, and, uh, and their, their previous pastor, they had just about run them out. In fact, the district superintendent had said, Gordon, if they give you any trouble, just close the church down. Just go ahead, close it. We don't want to, the bishop, we do not want to deal with this anymore. And we turn around, and over a period of six months or so, we started talking about the sin, not only in our lives, but have we committed any sins in this church? And they came to the conclusion that they had treated their previous minister poorly. They had just, he was ready to, to quit ministry altogether. And they said, Pastor, what should we do? I said, well, number one, we have to acknowledge the sin. Number two, we have to repent. And number three, we have to make it right. And they wrote a letter. They put it on the communion table. And the letter was read by the chair of the administrative council saying, Pastor so-and-so, we acknowledge that we have sinned in not treating you with the respect that you deserved as being appointed here and being a minister of God. We are sorry, and we promise, and we vow to pray for you 
in the rest of your ministry. And then the chair of the administrative council invited those who wanted to come forward could sign that letter and it would be delivered to this pastor. When that happened, the church began to turn around because they set their priorities on something other than themselves. Their priorities had all been about them. It had all been about, but what do I want? What do I like? As opposed to saying, where is God leading us? Oh, I thought of two extremes. If you go to Proverbs, the 28th chapter, the 13th verse, we would read something like this. The individual who conceals their sin will never prosper. But whoever confesses and renounces their sin will find mercy. Wow. I don't think it means, I don't think it means worldly stuff. I think it, that word prosper has a, has a ritualistic uh, connotation to it in the Hebrew. The person that conceals their sin in reality is, is, not, is never going to have that blessing of God. Oh, then if you go over to 1 John, and this is a verse that each one of us really should memorize and should be a part of our daily prayers. It should be something that sets our priority at the top of the list. If we confess, you could say if we set our priorities in line with God, if we put God first, guess what? God is faithful. God is just, and God will forgive our sins, and God will purify us from all of those things that are making our priorities out of whack. Oh, it's hard for most of us to come to this place of total honesty with God. It's difficult. We may be willing to do it with God, like we say we're going to do it, but then to come to a brother and a sister and to say, listen, I, I, I am sorry. When, when I said this, I really wasn't thinking of what God would want me to say first. In fact, most of us have that continual battle within us to be transparent with all of our dealings, especially when we're not putting God as the priority. I mean, all I have to do is say, hey, you want to take a look at the checkbook? Or hey, you want to follow me around for a day? And we can always turn around and figure out ways in, in, in which we can make good sense of, of the things we're doing, and we can make even better sense of not saying those three words that are so critical, that those words that show that we have come to the bottom, and we realize there's no other way to live healthy and to live a life that is transformed. You might say, what are those three magic words? Gordon, what are those magic words? I want those magic words to be a part of my life so I can be blessed. Well, let me give you those three words. You might want to write them down. I have sinned. That's simple. No one wants to say, remember Fonzie? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Can't get the word sorry out. That's what it is with us Christians, that the words that we should be on the tip of our tongues because we continually have to remind ourselves of the priorities to say, it's me, I've, I've not done it right. It's a good mark of spiritual health. Please listen carefully. It's a good mark that you're spiritually maturing. If it's easier for you to say, I am wrong. If it becomes easier for you to start saying, it was me, I was not the one that was thinking this through, it's a sign that you are on that path of spiritual maturity. But the one who denies that is lost. 
It means that you're ready to get your life right with God. It means that you're ready to start growing again in the grace that God has provided for us. Oh, I, I, can, I, can, I can tell you this, that in our homiletics 1, 2, and 3 classes, which are preaching classes in seminary, it was pounded into our mind, into our, into our psyche, that every sermon should have an application, something that someone can take home, something that someone can grab onto, a lifeline. So let me give it to you even before we get to Jonah. I, I encourage you to write it in your Bible and to write it on a notepad, to put it on the fridge, to put it on the rearview mirror unless it's going to hinder your view. Here's the phrase, Lord, show me the truth about myself. Show me the truth, those seven words. Show me the truth of who I am. Show me the truth of, of how I treat people. Show me the truth of how I am thinking. Because we oftentimes will just simply let it fog off to the side. And after you pray those seven words, then stop and be silent and wait because God will never speak over us. If we just keep going on and on, God will let us talk on and on because it doesn't mean that we've come to that point of surrender yet. That's why the last couple of weeks we've talked about the prodigal, the prodigal son, the prodigal prophet who's who's run away and has come to that point to where they're coming back and saying, I, it's me. And when we pray, the answer will begin to come and the Spirit will begin to show us where our weak spots are. We'll begin to, to, to put a spotlight on the faults that are there and, and the mistakes. It'll even help bring an awareness to our bad attitudes and, and foolish words, our pride, our arrogance. Oh, might I say, it will even illuminate our desire to be in control of things and to tell others what to do and, and to have our own desires be the only thing that's, that's, that's important. It'll show us our bitterness and our lack of mercy. If we pray those prayers, it will even show us that we're not truly, truly, Loving like Christ wants us to love because we're putting ourselves in front of others. It's even, God will even show us our lack of compassion. And I can tell you that I know from personal experience. It's that saying, God, please show me. And then sitting and waiting. Hard to do this. And that's the truth of what Jonah's finding himself in right now. I mean, in the second chapter of Jonah, this disobedient prophet who has been putting his own desires ahead of God finds himself in the belly of a great fish. And, and we know, we heard that God appointed the fish to catch and swallow Jonah alive and just the right moment, just the right place. But stop for a minute, and, and maybe this will be an image of what some of us are experiencing from time to time in life. What's it like to be inside of this fish? When our priorities get messed up and we're only thinking about ourselves, you know what? It becomes a dark place. Inside the belly of the fish, it's dark. You can't move around much. You get boxed in by all the ways that we try to find excuses for who we are and how we are. Oh, the, the fish is swimming, and if you know anything about, about marineology, that, that, that the, the water comes in and oxygenates, gives oxygen to the fish, and as this water is splashing all over you and seaweed is wrapping, as it describes in the book of Jonah, around his head. As unidentified objects are, are being knocked up against you. Inside of the fish, 
inside that dark place where we try to protect ourselves so that we can have what we want. It stinks. Inside that fish is slippery. It's greasy. And look at what happens in the first verse of the second chapter. From inside that dark place, Jonah cried out to God. It's never too late, my friends. It's never too late to cry out to God. I want you to notice that the the word cry is there, that he cried out to God in the Hebrew. It does not have a religious connotation to it. It is a literally screaming for help. Look what he says in the second second verse, in my distress, he said, I call out to the Lord and, and God answered me. In the depth of all that grave, that darkness, the stench of death, I cried for help and God, you listened. I mean, no boasting, but I think that Jonah understands that if God doesn't do something, if God doesn't save him, he'll never get out of this alive. The same is true of sin, my friends. Unless God saves us, we will never get out of this alive. In the third verse, Jonah quickly moves to a confession. If he's got God's ear, who knows how long that connection is going to be there. There's not a lot of cell towers out in the middle of the ocean. And so he He really quickly enters into this confession saying, God, I understand you threw me into this deep, dark space, into the very heart of the sea. Jonah doesn't blame the sailors. He doesn't blame himself. He just says, you know what? It's not the storm, God, but I understand. (laughs) You put me here. And he bows down before God and says, I'm here because you put me here in this place, God. I was running. I can always tell when someone's on that path of of spiritual growth because you know what? They stop blaming others. They stop blaming others. Oh, they made me, they made me angry. Or A, they they stop blaming others. Jonah knows that he can't blame the sailors, he can't blame the, the storm, he can't blame the fish. It's him. Thirdly, he feels like, boy, this is the last chance I've got to talk to God. If you look in the fifth fifth verse, we talked about it briefly, that the waters were threatening him. The deep surrounded him. Seaweed was wrapped around his head. There's no way out unless God's going to bring him out of this. And then he remembers. Yes, God is the only hope that I have. You skip down to the seventh verse, and he says, When my life was ebbing away, when there was no hope, when life was about to end for him, everything that he knew was going to be wiped out. He says, Oh, I remember you, God. You can do anything. And he finally starts to act like a true believer after running away and after all the disobedience. After being the prodigal prophet for so long, after all that self-centered living, Now God's got Jonah's entire attention. (laughs) I found this in my own life. I found this in the lives of others. I found it in our our family life as well from time to time that God will do whatever God has to do to make sure that God gets our attention. God doesn't want us to, to, to ebb away. God will sometimes use the hard knocks of life to to help nudge us back into the right place. Sometimes it's sickness or loss of a job or, or a family member. Sometimes it's repeated failure, failure after failure, heartbreak after heartbreak, broken relationship after broken relationship. Before 
we get to that point of saying, all right, God, I've been running a little bit here, and what do you want me to do? You've got my attention, God. He even tries to go back to the old ways. In verse 9, when he says, Jonah says, well, God, you got my attention. I remember you like songs of thanksgiving, right? Okay, you like sacrifices, God. I'll sacrifice to you. Uh, Listen, I know that I made some promises. Okay, I will make them come to pass. And you know, God, I'm good for it. Can you see that progress? Acknowledging where God's put him, accepting the discipline, knowing that he's not going to make it unless God brings him out of this, really remembering who's in charge of this whole thing. And then and only then does he vow to serve God. That's when he comes to this, I think, the most incredible passage, part of the passage in the book of Jonah. Salvation is of God. The hardest lesson that any of us can ever learn. Salvation starts with God. It doesn't start anywhere else. Salvation ends with God. Nothing else to be added to it. That's it. There is no salvation, no deliverance, no getting better until we realize that it ends and begins with God. If only we could live that. If only churches could begin to think about what matters the most. It's not if I'm on a committee. It's not if I'm leading something. It's not if I'm helping in a small group. We need to get our minds cleared of all these things and say it's about God. God alone. We put God and God's desires first and and our desires take that back seat so that salvation can take place. Let me wrap up this message with just a couple of observations so far, my friends. I think Jonah kind of talks a little bit about us and the fact that he was a prophet He was a prophet. He knew all the things that God was was interested in. He had studied. He was in communication with God, delivering God's words to his own people. But you know what? It had been a long time since Jonah had talked honestly with God. Not the superficial, now I lay me down to bed. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for his food. No. No. Honestly, to honestly talk with God. It's how easy it is and how frightening it is that that we, God's people, can go throughout great periods of our lives without really talking to God, without listening. I think that's part of the story. I I think it's, it's part of the story is sometimes God will put us in situations to where we have no place else to turn to but God. But even then, we try to put ourselves in front of what God is trying to teach us. I think another lesson that's there from this passage so far is that God had to actually stop Jonah in his tracks to get his attention. There's sometimes that we can be kind of meandering and God nudges us a little here, a little there, but this is hardcore disobedience. That's where the honesty comes in. I have to ask myself, have I deliberately been dishonest with God? Knowing God is asking me to do something and I say, I'll get there. My own way, God. I mean, just look at the couple of chapters that we've we've gone through so far. Jonah in the first chapter He acts and keeps messing things up. And in the second chapter, Jonah cries out to God. And when Jonah cries out to God, things start to get better. Thirdly, God seems to have this great love 
for reaching out and delivering people from the most impossible of situations. I mean, there is no way out of this belly of the fish. And even after Jonah gets out, we're going to find out that he still, he still thinks that, I think I can pull this off. So we get caught up in that uh, fish commanding, uh, God commanding that fish. And the Hebrew word, when it says, and he threw him up onto land. You want to know what the technical word for that is? Vomit. That's what it literally means. I think it's a good translation when we run from God. Sometimes we have to be expelled from the situation that we're in. Sometimes we have to find that there's no other place to go but to, to start again and ask God to clean us up from the inside out. But here's the good news. God's waiting for the prodigal's sons and daughters to come back home. He said, you don't have to be cleaned up first. I don't think that the fish kind of did this rinse cycle before he threw them out. He said, just come home. Can't wait to see you again. How hard it is. I think that's why Jesus himself spoke about this very story. He called... He spoke about it, this, he called it his own resurrection, a sign of the prophet Jonah. You find that in the 12th chapter of Matthew. As Jonah was in the belly of the fish, the great fish, even so Jesus was in the heart of the earth. As Jonah came out of the belly of the fish, Christ came out of the grave so that we might have salvation. Amazing grace. I once was blind, but now I see. Incredible grace, how sweet that sound. It actually saved someone who stunk like me. I was lost. I had no idea where I was at. Guess what? Jesus prayed the price, and now I'm found. So, my friends, if we learn anything from today, let's set our priorities straight. God has to come first. God's the only thing. And if that hasn't been our pattern, if it hasn't been a pattern in your life, Come home. Come home and, and enter into that, that relationship. Enter into the conversation and, and pray those, those words. Dear God, show me the truth about myself. Show me the way that, that I should go. Lord, show me where I've sinned. And more than anything else, Draw me close to you. Let us pray. Most holy God, we're so thankful that this chapter in the book of Jonah teaches us that we don't have to be perfect before we come back. If that's the case, there, none of us would qualify to come back home. I'm so grateful I don't even have to scrape the dirt off of my foolish mistakes before you will accept me. I mean, even if we tried to do that, we couldn't. All we have to do is just come home the way we are and be open to you to teach us and show us where we have sinned, where we've allowed other things to creep in and, and ahead of, of you, where we put ourselves 
on the top of our priority list. So glad that you're a friend of sinners. I'm so thankful for this, this story of Jonah. Because if Jonah gets a second chance, then, dear God, there's hope for me. There's hope for all of us. And so I guess that what we're praying is that we thank you for the grace to come home. And what we cry out for is the courage to take that step, to open ourselves up to your love and your mercy. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.